It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. Beneath the moon its wings unfold, a canvas black, a story cold, a beak that speaks in eerie cries, a terror masked in midnight skies. In childhood dreams, a memory lingers of twisted limbs and ghostly fingers. A primal fear that never wanes, a creature bound by ancient chains. It slithers amongst the twisted trees, a phantom born from mysteries. Its eyes a void, a cosmic dance, a haunting gaze, a fateful trance. From whispered winds, a tale untold, a vengeance sought of stories old. A grievance etched in spectral veins, a silent well, a creature's pains. It weaves through mist in shadow's cloak, a ghastly presence, a spectral yoke. In every rustle, every breeze, a chilling whisper through the trees. Beware the night when shadows cast, for in that realm the die is cast. A specter born of ancient lore, a haunting tale forevermore. Welcome to Freaky Folklore, the podcast where we discover horrifying legends across the world and tell terrifying tales of monsters both ancient and modern. This week we're discussing the fearsome Snallygaster, a cryptid that is a bird reptile chimera that is said to have been seen in Washington and Frederick counties in Maryland. This show is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network. Find more terrifying tales at EerieCast.com such as Destination Terror. You can listen to a new episode every week as I take you to horrifying destinations both real and mythical. Be sure to follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting service. You can leave an honest review on iTunes, too. The more we get, the more we grow, and hopefully, the more monsters we can explore. You can now find Freaky Folklore on YouTube as well. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. The clothes on the line in the backyard would dry in the afternoon sun, carrying the faint scent of laundry soap. I remember burying my face in the crisp, dry towels still hanging on the line when I was little. Mama would hide a giggle and then scold me. Abby, you're going to pull the clothes down, she would say with no real threat in her voice. My little brother was probably two around that time, because he was still in diapers, clumsy, always had a dirty face, and talked gibberish. I guess that would have made me six. So if my math stands correctly... Then this happened in the summer or spring of 1978. The memory feels almost like a dream now after all these years, but what I saw is still very clear. I was sitting on the ground, next to the big twin oak trees in the backyard. There was a patch of dirt where I had dug with sticks and spoons stolen from the kitchen, building roads, forts, and sometimes a mud pie or two. My brother was in one of his moods, clinging to mom's leg and crying while she tried to hang the wet laundry on the line. I could hear her telling him, go play with your sister. Of course, that was always her answer. At least it seemed that way to me then, and until I was old enough to figure out how to hide from my pest of a brother. This time was different, though. I remember because I was so relieved when she picked him up and carried him into the house. The most amazing part to me was that she had left me, when she usually made me go in as well. I had the whole yard to myself. The world suddenly seemed magical, and huge, without the watchful gaze of my mother. 
I laid back on the grass and watched the big limbs of the oak tree sway in the wind. I didn't know at the time that these oak trees were special. They had to be over a hundred years old, with massive trunks and limbs so large that my dad was able to make a swing out of a tractor tire to hang from one. I still miss those oak trees. As I stared up through the tree limbs, my mind running wild, making up songs and dreaming of magical places, the sky began to darken. The wind had been steady all morning, but it began to pick up, causing leaves and bits of branches to rain down all around me. There was no thunder or sprinkles of rain promising a storm, just the wind that grew stronger. Then I noticed a sound. It was hard to describe, but it sounded kind of like when Mom would shake out the rugs or towels before hanging them on the line, but louder. While I was laying there still staring up through the tree limbs, I saw something large, easily spanning the top of the oak trees. It landed right amongst the highest limbs and perched. I squinted, trying to make out what it was. I thought at first someone's kite had hung in the tree, like mine had before, but it was too large. My curiosity getting the better of me, I climbed to my feet and grabbed a stick and flung it up towards the top of the tree. Of course, it didn't go very far before falling back down and almost striking me in the face. Using my brilliant six-year-old mind, I deduced that a rock would travel farther. So I picked up a rock, just large enough to fill the palm of my hand, and I hurled it up as fast and high as I could. I was shocked when it made contact, even more shocked when the object began to move, causing the entire tree to shake. Excited by the results, I reached down and picked up another rock of similar size and threw it at the same spot that the last made contact. This time I almost pissed my pants when a loud shriek rang out and the tree limbs began to bend. Frozen in shock or horror, I'm not sure which, I stood there and watched as the branches parted and a large head, tipped with a shiny beak, made its way down toward me. I couldn't move, even if I tried, but I don't think I did, not at first. I watched this beaked monster snake its way down until its face was only a few feet from mine. I began to back away, crawling backwards until my hand landed on another stick. I grabbed it and held it firmly in my hand. It was so close by then I could smell its foul breath as it stretched its jaws wide. Terror seemed to paralyze me as I watched these strange tentacles slither from its mouth and reach for me, caressing my face with their slimy tips. When one of the tentacles wrapped around my neck and began to pull, I struck at it using the stick like a dagger, plunging it into the creature's amber-colored reptilian eye. It made a horrible popping sound, and a clear fluid oozed down my hand and wrist. I had finally found my voice as well, and I let out a blood-curdling scream as the creature loosened its grip. I ran for the house as fast as my little feet could carry me. My scream had startled my mother who had been laying my brother down for a nap. She put her fingers to her lips, shushing me, frustrated that I had almost died and she was worried about waking my brother. I began to cry. Tears were the last resort in most cases, but usually got the quickest results. She held me in her arms and comforted me until I calmed down. I tried to explain to her what I'd seen, but she said it was just my imagination. She said that I must have gotten carried away while playing pretend. When that failed to console me, she took my hand and led me out to the backyard, where there was no sign of a creature. But I knew what I had seen, and as we turned to head back into the house, a large branch gave way and crashed to the ground. The tree limb scared my mother so bad that she wouldn't let me play under the twin oaks for weeks after that. I didn't care, because it took that long for me to be brave enough to go back. That was the first time I saw the Snallygaster, and it wouldn't be my last. But years passed, 
and the memory faded like a bad dream. Although I never got over the feeling of being watched, when I wandered out back near the woods and the tall twin oak trees. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate, complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. Cryptids, creatures of myth and legend that elude scientific classification have long fascinated and mystified people around the world. From the Loch Ness Monster to Bigfoot, these enigmatic beings continue to capture our imaginations. In the pantheon of cryptids, one that stands out as uniquely American is the Snallygaster. This elusive creature, said to inhabit the Appalachian region of the United States, has a history rich in folklore, mystery, and even a touch of presidential intrigue. In this exploration, we delve into the legend of the Snallygaster, its origins, encounters, and its enduring place in American folklore. The Snallygaster is a cryptid with roots deep in American history, especially in the Appalachian region of the East Coast. German immigrants settled in Frederick County, Maryland, starting in the 1730s. Historical records depict the community being haunted by a creature known as Schnellergeist, translating to Quick Ghost. In German, the initial depictions of this entity combined the half-bird characteristics of a siren with the nightmarish features of demons and ghouls. The Snallygaster was described as a hybrid creature, part reptile and part bird, sporting a metallic beak and razor-sharp teeth, sometimes accompanied by octopus-like tentacles. These attributes set the Snallygaster apart from many other cryptids. Rumors circulated that the Snallygaster would silently descend from the sky to seize and carry away its prey, with early tales suggesting it fed on the blood of its victims. To ward off this mythical creature, locals painted seven-pointed stars on barns, a practice that can still be observed today. Throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, reports of Snallygaster sightings were relatively common in the Appalachian region. Witnesses often described the creature as having a massive wingspan, with some accounts estimating it to be as wide as 20 feet. Its body was said to be covered in scales, and it had large glowing red eyes that struck terror into anyone who happened upon it. One of the most well-documented and sensationalized encounters with the Snallygaster occurred in the early 1900s in Frederick County. Newspapers at the time were rife with reports of the creature terrorizing the local population. Some even claimed that it had a penchant for abducting and devouring livestock. The Snallygaster's reign of terror prompted a response from the townsfolk, who organized armed patrols to hunt down the beast. These efforts, however, yielded no conclusive evidence of the creature's existence, leading skeptics to dismiss the sightings as hoaxes or the product of overactive imaginations. Nonetheless, the fear of the Snallygaster persisted, and it was even said to have struck a deal with another cryptid, the Dwayo, to divide hunting territories. The Dwayo, often described as a wolf-like creature, allegedly agreed not to harm the Snallygaster's chosen prey, allowing the bird-like cryptid to roam freely in its territory. The legend of the Snallygaster took a bizarre and unexpected turn when it found its way into the realm of politics. 
In 1909, just as the Snallygaster sightings were gaining attention, newspapers reported that President Theodore Roosevelt, an avid outdoorsman and adventurer, had expressed an interest in hunting the creature himself. Roosevelt's interest in the Snallygaster added an air of credibility to the legend, as it is widely reported that the President was planning an expedition to track down the elusive cryptid. While Roosevelt's hunt for the Snallygaster never materialized, the public hysteria surrounding the creature reached a fever pitch. People were both terrified and intrigued by the idea of a presidential monster hunt. Newspapers, always eager to sell more copies, continued to publish sensational stories about the Snallygaster and Roosevelt's supposed pursuit. In the end, it was revealed that the reports of Roosevelt's involvement in the Snallygaster hunt were likely a hoax or a case of sensationalized journalism. Nonetheless, the Snallygaster had firmly embedded itself in American popular culture and it remained a subject of fascination for years to come. While sightings of the Snallygaster have become increasingly rare in recent years, its legacy endures in American folklore and popular culture. The creature has made appearances in various forms of media, from books and films to television shows and video games. One notable literary work featuring the Snallygaster is The Snallygaster of Landenberg, written by Patrick Boyton in 2006. The book explores the cryptid's history and its impact on a small Maryland town, blending elements of horror and suspense with the rich folklore surrounding the creature. In the realm of television, the Snallygaster has appeared in episodes of popular series such as Lost Tapes and Mountain Monsters. These portrayals often draw upon the traditional descriptions of the creature, featuring it as a fearsome winged monster that terrorizes rural communities. Video games have also embraced the Snallygaster, with titles like Fallout 76 incorporating it as a cryptid enemy for players to encounter and defeat. In the game, the Snallygaster is depicted as a mutated creature with a reptilian appearance, a nod to the creature's legendary origins. In the modern era, the Snallygaster has become a subject of debate among cryptozoologists and enthusiasts of the unexplained. While some continue to believe in its existence and share accounts of alleged encounters, others view it as nothing more than a product of folklore or superstition. Skeptics argue that the Snallygaster, like many cryptids, is a myth perpetuated by a combination of misidentifications, hoaxes, and a desire for mystery and excitement. They point to the lack of concrete evidence, such as photographs or physical specimens, as a reason to doubt the creature's existence. Cryptozoologists, on the other hand, maintain that there may be some truth to the Snallygaster legend. They argue that undiscovered species are regularly being found, and it's possible that a reclusive and highly elusive creature like the Snallygaster could remain hidden in the remote forests and mountainous terrain of the Appalachian region. In recent years, efforts to document the Snallygaster and other cryptids have shifted from traditional methods to technological advancements. Game cameras, motion-activated recording devices, and drones are now commonly used to survey remote areas and capture potential evidence of cryptids. Despite these efforts, however, the Snallygaster remains as elusive as ever. The Snallygaster, with its unique blend of folklore, history, and presidential intrigue, stands as a proof of the enduring power of cryptids in every culture. Whether one believes in its existence or dismisses it as myth, the legend of the Snallygaster continues to captivate the imagination and inspire curiosity. As with many cryptids, the Snallygaster's true nature remains shrouded in mystery, making it a symbol of the unknown and the unexplained. In a world where science and technology have unraveled so many secrets, the allure of cryptids like the Snallygaster reminds us that there are still mysteries waiting to be discovered in the wild, untamed places of our planet. Whether the Snallygaster is a genuine cryptid or a figment of our collective imagination, it will always have a place in the rich tapestry of American folklore and legend. The white oak tree in my front yard was at least 100 years old, judging by the diameter of its trunk. 
My love of trees began at an early age when I was still just a little blonde girl with pigtails, trying to climb to the top of every tree I could find. My interest in plants, trees in particular, only grew as it followed me into adulthood. I considered myself an amateur botanist, even though I probably had as much knowledge of the trees here in Maryland as anyone with a degree. I bought this house because of that oak tree. I even called it Old Man Oak. Every morning I would pour myself a cup of coffee and sit on the porch swing with Charlie, my schnauzer, lazing beneath me, while I watched the sun rise on the hillside just behind the old man. There was a bite to the breeze this morning, forewarning the beginning of fall. Soon the old man's green leaves would be fading until they turned a bright golden orange or red and then slowly transitioning to brown before they fell to the ground. A low rumbling growl from Charlie pulled me from my thoughts of the changing seasons back to the here and now. What's wrong, boy? Do you see those pesky squirrels out there gathering nuts again? I had barely finished the sentence when Charlie jumped to his feet and his growl turned into a full-scale barking frenzy. Every hair on his back was standing on end. This wasn't his squirrel alarm. It was something else altogether. What is it, Charlie? I doubt he even heard me, because he took off so fast. I didn't even see his feet hit the steps before he was on the ground. I wasn't really worried since my house was out in the woods, and there weren't any main roads for quite a way. It wasn't uncommon for him to go off exploring in the mornings. I leaned back on the swing and continued to sip my coffee, as Charlie's barks faded into the distance. I was trying to imagine what exactly had gotten my little friend so worked up. Could it be one of the neighbors out for a stroll through the woods? Or maybe it was that stray dog that had been snooping around lately. I drained the last drops of coffee from my mug and stood to go inside when a sound from the woods halted my steps. Crashing, flapping, both words could describe it. It was also very familiar, almost stirring memories that were just out of reach. My pulse quickened as I searched the tree line for the source of the noise. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary until Charlie broke through the tall weeds and made a mad dash toward me. I had never seen him run so fast, with his tail between his legs. He jumped onto the porch and into my arms, knocking me off balance. I nearly dropped my coffee mug. Good Lord, Charlie. You act like you had a grizzly on your tail. There, there, you're safe now. I crooned as I scratched the top of his head and cradled him in my arms. Looking back towards the woods, I wondered again what had made the noise and spooked Charlie. But it was getting late and I needed to get my day started. The drive into town was nice as the sun peeked through the trees that canopied the road making kaleidoscope designs on the ground. Charlie hung his head out the truck window absorbing the smells of the warming day. There were several people at the hardware store when we arrived, which wasn't a surprise since Oak Bridge was mostly a farming town. Almost every property in the community is either farmed or ranched. I was the only tree farmer, which gave me a corner on the market for large trees in the area. My customers were mostly landscapers and new homeowners. Charlie! I heard the familiar voice of Frank, the store owner, from behind the register. Did you come in for a treat? You know the drill. This was a routine that played out every time we came to the hardware store. Sit. Charlie had already taken the sitting position, eager for the piece of beef jerky he knew would be his reward. You spoil him, Frank. I smiled at the wiry, gray-haired man. And you don't? He laughed back in reply. Touché, I replied, because I knew he was right. The only thing I loved more than my trees was Charlie. While Charlie was playing with Frank, I headed to the greenhouse to see if there were any plants in need of rescue. I was scrutinizing several ferns that looked like they needed a little help when I heard two young boys talking. I know it's real. I saw it. The first boy with red hair and freckles was insisting. I caught sight of the taller boy with dark hair as he frowned down into the face of the other boy. You know what's going to happen if you don't quit making up stories. Dad's going to take a switch to your backside. 
I know what I saw. And it may not have been a dragon, but it sure looked like one. The boy said as he ducked his head. And you know what? That may be why there have been so many dogs come up missing lately. I'm not sure why, but I thought of the noise I heard out in the woods this morning and the way Charlie had reacted. I shook my head. I was too old to be listening to the imaginations of kids, but the story seemed to ring a bell, reminding me of something from my own childhood. On the way home, I couldn't shake the strange feeling of deja vu. It was like memories were just on the surface waiting to break through. It was mid-afternoon by the time Charlie and I arrived back home. After a quick lunch, which only consisted of the usual peanut butter sandwich and a glass of milk, I walked down to the trees with Charlie on my hills. I ambled down the alleys, admiring the various species I had cultivated over the years. The deciduous trees stood proudly, their leaves shimmering in the afternoon light, while the evergreens provided a constant backdrop of verdant tranquility. I couldn't help but marvel at the vibrant tapestry of nature I had created. My fingers gently grazed the bark on an oak tree, tracing the intricate patterns that marked its growth. I bent down to inspect the soil around the base, checking for any signs of disturbance. Every detail of their well-being was crucial. Moving through the field of trees, I noted the subtle changes in color, the delicate unfurling of new leaves, and the promising growth of the saplings I had planted with meticulous care. It was a ritual, a daily communion with nature that brought me both peace and purpose. As I reached the heart of the farm, where the sunlight filtered through the branches in dappled patterns, I paused to take in the symphony of rustling leaves and the soothing whispers of the wind. It was my favorite part of the day, a time when the trees seemed to communicate their silent secrets. As I strolled through the familiar alleys of my tree farm, the memories of the recent disturbances in the woods lingered in my mind. The deja vu that haunted me earlier intensified with each step. The sunlight filtered through the leaves, casting intricate patterns on the ground, but an uneasy tension hung in the air. Suddenly, the peaceful atmosphere shattered as a rush of wind swept through the tree alleys. The young trees swayed and danced in response to an unseen force, and the rhythmic flapping sounds from that morning returned. The air crackled with an unsettling energy, and my senses heightened. Amidst the rustling leaves, a screech echoed through the air, causing me to startle. Charlie, sensing the disturbance, began barking furiously, his protective instincts taking over. The sound was otherworldly, a haunting cry that sent shivers down my spine. Reacting swiftly, I snatched Charlie up in my arms, his barks merging with the eerie sounds that surrounded us. He struggled, eager to confront the unseen threat, but I held him close, my heart pounding in my chest. The wind intensified, making the young tree sway even more, as if nature itself was reacting to the presence of an unknown force. The unsettling noises persisted, and a sense of foreboding gripped me. Fear mingled with curiosity as I scanned the tree farm for any sign of the mysterious creature that I had heard the young boy describing earlier. Every rustle and flap seemed to echo the past, connecting the present to the childhood memory that haunted me. With Charlie still squirming in my arms, I retreated from the tree alleys and headed back toward the safety of my house. The unsettling sounds accompanied us, and the air felt charged with an otherworldly energy. Memories began to surface, and the creature from my childhood merged with the present, creating a surreal and unnerving experience. Reaching the porch, I glanced back at the tree farm, the rustling leaves and flapping sounds gradually fading. The mysteries that entwined my sanctuary with supernatural forces seemed to deepen, and a realization dawned upon me. The Snallygaster. That's what it had been called back then. Or whatever it was. It wasn't just a memory, but a living presence that continued to weave its menacing threads into my life. As I closed the door behind us, the echoes of screeches and flapping wings lingered, leaving an unsettling aura that hinted at a more profound connection between my past, the present disturbances, and the elusive creature that inhabited the woods. 
the sanctuary I had once found solace in, now stood at the crossroads of mystery and the unknown. I no longer felt safe. I felt like a six-year-old again, filled with terror and no place to run. Later that night, sleep eluded me as an uneasy restlessness lingered in the air. Even Charlie, who usually slept peacefully at my feet, seemed nervous. After tossing and turning for what felt like hours, exhaustion finally claimed me, and I drifted off into a fitful slumber. The peace of the night shattered when I was abruptly woken by scratching sounds. Charlie's low growls reverberated through the room, signaling an unwelcome presence. The creature was back. Panic surged through me as I fumbled to turn on the bedside lamp. I heard glass shatter, and to my horror, I saw the creature's long serpentine neck snaking through the shattered window, its shiny beak glistening in the dim light. It reached for Charlie, who barked and snapped in a desperate attempt to fend off the intruder. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I grabbed the nearest object, my small table lamp, and swung it at the Snallygaster's head. The creature screeched in pain, retracting its neck momentarily. That's when I noticed the missing eye, and I knew for sure it was the same creature from all those years ago. For a brief moment, I wondered if it had finally come for me. Seizing the opportunity, I rushed to the dresser and grabbed a can of bug repellent spray. In a desperate attempt to ward off the creature, I sprayed the repellent directly at its face. It recoiled, emitting distressed sounds. The repellent seemed to have a potent effect, causing the giant lizard bird to retreat further from the window. Summoning my courage, I continued to spray the repellent, creating a barrier between us. The creature, unable to endure the effects of the spray, retreated into the shadows with one final, frustrated screech. The room fell silent, except for Charlie's continued growls gradually subsiding into wary watchfulness. Exhausted, but victorious, I carefully tended to Charlie's wounds, soothing him with gentle words. It's okay, boy. I won't let that horrible creature get you. The repellent spray, a simple yet effective tool, had saved us. The encounter left my sanctuary feeling violated and my sense of security shattered. But I had to do something more. This monster would likely return. I knew deep in my gut that it would be back. It had a score to settle with me for taking its eye. I had to stop it and make sure it could never hurt me or Charlie. I wouldn't let it run me from my home. I reached for the phone on the nightstand to call 911, but then I hesitated. What could I tell them that they would actually believe? Definitely not that a large reptilian bird dragon monster had broken in through my bedroom window. Can you think of the perfect ending for this story? How does Abby plan to protect herself and Charlie from the Snallygaster? Does she ward it off? Does she defeat it? Or does it come back and drag her and Charlie away? If you would like to submit your version of the ending to today's story, send it to my email and I will choose an ending to record and release this coming Saturday morning. Be sure to send your name and location if you would like to receive credit for your ending. Thank you for listening to Freaky Folklore, the podcast about mankind's horrifying legends and myths. Don't forget to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes. If you can, leave the show an honest review on iTunes to help us grow. Freaky Folklore is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network, the home for listeners who love to feel scared. Go to EerieCast.com to find other terrifying podcasts, such as Destination Terror, hosted by me, Carmen Carrion. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to CarmenCarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Until next time, 
Stay safe out there, because this world is a strange one. <laughs>